this is an atom. An atom is said to be indivisible. But if it's split and it has been done into parts, it can destroy the earth at large, just a small atom. This is a little seedling for those of you who love to do gardening. It takes the unity of the soil, light and water to grow this seedling. Any absence of one or the other is detrimental to the seedling. This is an engine of a car. It takes the cooperation of the components, which we don't see nowadays in modern cars. The engine of the car to move an automobile. We just switch on the ignition and we, the car moves, but there's many mechanisms that's happening within the engine. This is a man or a human being. So as far as a man is concerned, it takes food, clothing and shelter to continue to keep a person alive. The absence of any of this can shorten a man or a woman's life. But of course, in this new age, there's one more factor, and that is the Wi-Fi. For some people, they believe that the Wi-Fi is essential for survival. Food, shelter, and clothing are just optional. In the risk of war, it takes the cooperation of soldiers in a battle to win a war. You don't win a war by yourself. You win a war as a team or as an army. In building a house or a building, it takes a setting of concrete blocks with mortar, or here we call it cement, for building a house which will keep it strong and being able to live in. All these factors are what we call unity. And a united nation is a strong nation. And finally, a united church is a strong church. And nowadays, a little virus called COVID-19 has actually united the world in some ways. And a little virus called COVID-19 has also divided the world. And what do I mean by that? You have factions today called the mask who are pro-mask. You have factions today, anti-mask. And right now, the contention is the vax or the anti-vax. What do I mean? Have you registered for your vaccine yet? Or are you with one that is anti-vaccine? That united the people stand, divided the people for, or the nation falls. So it's no wonder that 1 Corinthians starts off a very serious note. Last week, we talked about that. With Paul getting straight down to the business of exposing the first fault of the Corinthian church, which was division in the church. It was a real threat to his one and a half years of ministry and hard work that he had done together with Priscilla and Aquila in the city of Corinth to build up the Corinthian church. So this was the first issue that he addresses, and that is division in the church. Can you remember what was the root cause of the division? One word alone, that was wisdom. And chapter one and two alone, you can see the word wisdom repeating and repeating and repeating itself. So if you were to actually just read chapter one and two, you think that you would think that the two chapters are basically on wisdom. It is on wisdom, but what is the connection between the wisdom and the division? Tell me. So the root cause of the, the division was rivalry, rivalry between the gangs, competition, who is smarter, mixing worldly philosophies with the preaching of the gospel. So they were using measurement of the world standard of wisdom now that has penetrated into the church. In fact, if you read between the lines, there is a, something about undermining Paul's ministry. Because Paul will talk about his simple gospel. He preaches only Christ, Christ and Christ alone. That there seemed to be some criticism about his teaching being lack of so-called wisdom. That's why he talked so much about that. So now we will go on to chapter 3 and 4, having in mind that the issue at hand is division. Firstly, the problem among the people was that they were immature. 
Paul said that they were not ready for solid spiritual food. They were fleshly. What does it mean by solid spiritual food? It means that the people were not ready for advanced spiritual teaching, for advanced biblical instructions, all driven by envy and strife. And there was great division among the disciples. Different people were following different leaders and they look up to man's wisdom and knowledge rather than depending on Christ. They boast in human leaders instead of in Christ. And the reasoning of the wise in the eyes of Paul is that is meaningless. In the eyes of God, human wisdom is meaningless, just like a plant which, we, which needs the sunlight to grow, as well as fertilizer, good soil, and water. So while the apostles plant and lead us water, God is the one who grants, grants growth. And we are all God's workers with different roles, different functions, and different callings. No one is greater than the other. Jesus Christ himself is the foundation of spiritual growth. So if we lean on him alone, if we lean on his teaching, we will definitely grow. We are also God's sanctuary and we ought to be holy. What does it mean by that? No one is more holy than the other. We are only treated as holy when we have accepted the anointment of uh, salvation from Jesus Christ. It's only The only difference between us and the sinners are that we are still sinners, but we are already sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we are ought not to rely on human wisdom because believers, believers who think he is wise is foolish. It is because when you think you are good enough, we stop learning and we boast on our own knowledge. And Paul has shown a very good example of fatherly love. By the way, he taught out of love, not out of anger, not out of hatred. So let us all imitate the way he showed his fatherly love, care, and, and lifestyle. Because the kingdom of God is not about talking, it's not about showing off, but it is of power, which is from Christ alone. All the detailed points. And do you realize that in Paul's writings, it always has that. First, we are talking about division in chapter 1 and 2. But sometimes, Paul goes off a different tangent. And he talks about this, he talks about that, he talks about this and everything. And at the end of the day, like what David was talking about last week, you find it a little bit hard to understand, isn't it? Because so many factors, so many facts have been presented very well by Priscilla. But earlier, we were talking about division. Then he's talking about plants, he's talking about this, he's talking about wisdom, then he's talking about buildings and all that. How do you understand Pauline theology, the writings of Paul? That's why the writings of Paul is always mistakenly used. And yet it is very important for us to study the writings of Paul because you know why? How many letters did Paul write? Tell me. 13. That's right, 13. So out of 27 books of the New Testament, he wrote almost half of it, 13 of it. Why it's so hard to understand? Because he writes sometimes very contradictory. I want to give you one observation today to perhaps help you. This is part of Bible study. This is what I learned in homiletics when we learn about how to preach and how to write scripts for preaching. If and after you understand these two words, you, you will better understand Paul's writing. It is called deductive or inductive reasoning. Very big words, but example. What is a deductive reasoning? Example, vaccine. Today, I say, okay, I'm, not, I'm going to talk to you all about vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. Right? The COVID-19 vaccine is actually very good. Because you know, for the last one year, we've all been locked down and millions of people have died because of COVID-19 and we have been separated from our loved ones. So I urge you all to actually go and register for the COVID-19 vaccine. So what did I do? I used deductive reasoning by telling you first just now, I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19 vaccine. So I state the fact, then I present my explanation, my defense, my expansion, and then I sum it up by stating the fact again. 
So this is talk about the subject matter. So deductive reasoning means that I pose the subject matter first. Inductive reasoning would be like this. Talking about the COVID thingy. You know that we started our lockdown in March of 18, uh, March 18 last year. For three months, all of us could not work. Many of us lost jobs. Many people lost loved ones because of COVID-19 and, and the consequences of the disease. And the whole world was on lockdown. And today we are still suffering from the effects of COVID-19 in terms of economy, financial, physical, spiritual, etc. So now that the COVID-19 vaccine is here, I do hope that all of us will register and protect ourselves. So that is inductive reasoning. Means that I build the story, I tell the grandmother's story first, and then the subject matter comes at the end. Because Paul uses these two, deductive as well as inductive. Do you think Paul uses deductive more or inductive? That means straight to the point first, tell you you're wrong first, or does he tell a long story and then tell you you're wrong? Both. You are right, Linda. Very good observation. Paul uses both. He uses both and you can actually go back and try to analyze. When we first started the book of Galatians, remember the book of Galatians was talking about grace and legalism. Actually, the book of Galatians was really talking about circumcision. Paul did not talk about circumcision until chapter 5, which is 5 verse 2. So he starts off and he talks about grace and talks about the law, Moses, legalism, everything. He talks about the uncircumcised, talks about Titus. Only at the end of chapter 5, he says this, guys, if you let yourselves be circumcised, then Christ is of no benefit to you. He builds the story until then. That's the reason why people get confused with Galatians and they, talk, they think that Galatians is about the, the, the mosaic law being done away with. Because they didn't understand the reasoning that Paul was following. Because at the end of the day, it's about circumcision. You think, what method is Paul using? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3. These are the three chapters. Four. Four chapters, he's talking about actually the same topic. From the very beginning, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. After he greets everybody, he says, peace be with you and all that. Straight away, Ben, can you read this? Because you say deductive, very good point. Ben, can you read this? Live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Correct. So, Paul states the fact from the very beginning. You understand what I'm talking about? He already states the fact. Then after that, he veers off to talk about wisdom. He veers off to talk about his ministry. He veers off to talk about other things. He talks about the factions of Apollos, this and that, and that. So it is deductive reasoning he's using. You get what I mean? So I want you, when you are studying, it will help you when you are doing, you have to do your presentations or even in your own personal Bible study. Or if you are preaching, this is one of the ways you can do is either deductive or inductive. But in studying the epistle of Paul, you need to understand the subject matter. Otherwise, you get the whole theology wrong. That's why a lot of people pick up verses and form a theology which pastors say you must never do such things. So he starts off in chapter 1, verse 10, about division. Finally, he ends chapter 3. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future. Everything belongs to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Chapter 3, at the end, he says a very simple thing. Don't follow a particular human leader. After all the, the writings the, in the three chapters, it comes back down to this. Don't follow a particular human leader, which is the problem in the Corinthian church. They were following a particular leader. And I'm not talking about Paul or Apollos causing the contention. I don't think so. It must be some of the other downline leaders that are doing that. So here it says, all of them, basically, Paul, Apollos, Peter, they belong to you. Because why? 
you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Kasing. If we have this issue in our church, how can we address it or how would we resolve the issue of divisions in the church? The Bible always gives the solution. Sometimes we think that the Bible is too simplistic because chapter 4 goes to give the solution to the division. Some angry, frustrated tone in it. But however, he has to address the issue. And how does he address the issue of division in the church? Now, we can learn this when we have division in the organization, in our company, in our family. We can surely use, because this is organizational. First thing he does is that he says, I do not write these things to make a shame, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Paul does not play politics or he's not a people pleaser. He's not a people pleaser. That is when he sees something wrong, he has to address it. Too many pastors and leaders are people pleasers and politicians. Means that they are more concerned about their positioning than to stand up to rebuke what is right or wrong. So Paul was not like that. So he's writing, but he's writing in a very nice fatherly way. He says that, I don't write this to make you ashamed. I'm not out to humiliate you. Admonishing is warning, is rebuking you as my beloved children. Priscilla said that he was a spiritual father to the Corinthians. So he establishes his authority first. So the one that has to address the division issue in the church is the leader himself. The pastor cannot hide behind a church board or hide behind the members when he has to address a major issue in the church. Amen. Secondly, he says this, for this reason, I'm sending you. So he needs to now connect with the people, but unfortunately, he's not able to go for whatever reason. Perhaps he has things to do in Ephesus. Remember, he's in Ephesus now. So he's sending my son, Timothy. It's not really his biological son. It's his spiritual son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Jesus Christ, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. I had one of the chat uh, observations last week when we, I asked for solutions. One of the chat, I believe it's me, the, one of the suggestions was refocus on the <clears throat> objectives of the church, why they are there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was what Paul had in mind. Send Timothy to remind them about the main objectives of them becoming Christians and setting up the church. All right. When we come to this kind of issue, we cannot find anybody neutral. Unfortunately, that advice is not a correct advice for this circumstance. A neutral person will be good for the next chapter, the issue that's coming up the next chapter. This issue has to handle within the church. Too many times we ask the mission president to come in and he causes more problems than solutions. I'm talking about churches that do not handle issues by themselves. And here Paul is saying, look, I'm the leader. I'm telling you guys, go back to the drawing board. Go back to the initial source. Go back to the initial objective. And I'm sending you Timothy, who is my guy, to tell you what is true and what is right. There is no sitting on the fence or no playing balance. Amen. We had so much problems with the last time. Amen. As far as a corporate issue is concerned, don't get anybody neutral. Settle it within the church itself. And Paul is stating his authority as a leader and sending Timothy, who is also a co-leader, to sort it out. In chapter 4, verse 19, I will come to you soon. You see, Paul is not washing his hands. He's not hiding under the carpet. He says, I've got to come and sort this out. And I will find out not only the talk of these arrogant people, but also their power. <laughs> it's a warning to the guys that are causing problems. So he will go back to find out the source and he's going to sort them out. Right? He doesn't say what he's going to do, but I believe it's not going to be too pleasant too pleasant. He's going to be personally involved. So it gives us an idea now in church, how do we handle it? Of course, church has church boards, right? Church boards. But church boards must act on the advice as well as the leadership of the shepherd of the church who is the pastor. And the pastor must live up to that kind of authority. Because why? He has Jesus behind him. He has Amen. nothing to fear. 
So now let's go to Tim May. Now we have other issues. Corinthians have many, many issues. Chapter 5, basically, Paul addresses the sexual immorality ongoing in the church of Corinthians. A man had his father's wife, and if someone was having an ongoing sexual relationship with his stepmother, which means his father's wife. Also in chapter 5, Paul rebuking them for being proud instead of mourning and that take the sin lightly, unconcerned about the issue. Paul wrote that the church should call a meeting and take actions regarding the problem before it become worse. To six, summary. Here, Paul addressed about taking brethren to court before unbeliever. Paul rebuked the Corinthians that they should seek advice. Okay, is there not a wise man among you? This is what he's saying in his letter. The Corinthians Christians were proud of what they thought was their wisdom, which mentioned by Sister May in earlier presentation just now. But their actions show that there was not a wise man among them when they're behaving or they act in this way. He reprimanded the Corinthian church that they should remember the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit to glorify God with their bodies. Points to take note. There are few here. Chapter five main points is Paul tell the, the church, the Corinthians, the problem of sexual immorality within the church. And the second is instructions for dealing with this problem at this. As a church, a Christian, a believer, issue related to immorality should be addressed and not equal it as open mind. Oh, it's okay, he repented. Oh, it's okay, he won't do again. Oh, it's okay, come, come, come. Or don't tolerance with this issue. Paul is more concerned about the sins of the entire church, especially the leadership, that the sin of the individual man. He's looking into this matter. Your leadership is required to, the church leadership required to settle this issue, chapter five, chapter six. Then the, both are important, but the sin of the church is worse. Don't be busy judging those outside of the church. But we as a Christian neglecting purity within the church. These are all basically more personal issues. The first one is the gossipy one. Read verse 2 carefully. And you are proud is that actually the sexual immorality is a big issue. Right? Cohabiting or sleeping with a father's wife is, is really in, unthinkable even in the, in the Gentile world. But Paul emphasizes that the church is proud of it or you are puffed up. Why is the church proud of it? Because the you is the church, you know. Why? In Corinth is actually Greek, Greece uh, territory, right? Mm. And there are definitely mm. pagans, as we know, as the mytholo mm. mythology, and mm. okay. there, okay. there will be Afro Aphrodite or any of these gods. Yes, and Aphrodite they, goddess. Correct. Yeah. Then there is like a temple over there that there's like okay. profoundly mm. telling people about prostitution mm. and you can actually, you know, enjoy the desire and things like that in there. Right. So I think the Christians over there actually think that it's okay to, you know, blend in with this kind of culture. Yeah. Maybe he's somebody of um, influence. Possible. You're right. You're right. The leaders are doing that. Maybe he's a leader. Maybe he's an elder. Who knows? And he's so proud of it. And they are gossiping among each other. The guys, you know, hey, look, you know, this beautiful, gorgeous woman and all that. I managed to get her. Who issue? And Paul was so mad. So Paul says, you gather them now and you kick this guy out. Okay, and not only that, verse 5, turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is a very difficult verse that even the theologians cannot figure it out yet. What does Paul mean about that? So go back and figure it out on this nice Sabbath afternoon. Right? Uh, first question about why these people do this thing. You know, maybe, remember the in the Bible, if you think back to the, the Old Testament, about King David? What do you think of, about him? What did he do? So, 
this is uh, like a precedent, you know, they want to follow. King David. Yes, oh, you're oh, right. Oh, oh, what? No, forgive him because he's king. He can do anything. I am sure that is one of the arguments, Mr. Lai. They're following leadership. That's what May was talking about. Good argument. Good argument, good observation. I want to discuss with you what happens if you are the very good Christian, you're sitting there, not doing anything, and suddenly another fellow Christian sues you. What would you do? Next week will be our discussion. Okay, think out of the box, think about practical things that we can apply the Bible.